Tasting Climate Change wishes to thank all of the sponsors supporting the conference. This specific seminar is made possible by... The moderator for this seminar is Michel Bouffard. Michel is the founder of Tasting Climate Change, an author, a wine educator, and a journalist. She recently co-wrote a book called Quel Vin Pour Demain, which was published last September by Duneau. The book explores solutions for the wine industry to adapt and mitigate climate change. Bonjour, welcome to the sixth seminar of Tasting Climate Change. Today we're looking at hybrids for solutions. Um, with the increase of disease pressure, uh, hybrids are becoming more popular again, or at least people are looking to see if hybrids could be the solution to adapt to climate change. Um, according to l'Institut Français de la Vigne et du Vin, uh, currently in France, this is an, an interesting statistics, 80% uh, of the fungicide used in France are due to uh, disease pressure, to fungal disease. And they say, or they think, that if we would use hybrids, we could actually reduce or uh, cancel altogether the use of fungicides. Uh, an hybrid is an offspring of two different varieties of different species. Uh, they, can occur, they can occur naturally, but of course, with time, uh, men made hybrids. They were trying to find a solution. They became popular in the 1900s. We're trying to, to use the American species that were more resistant to diseases or pests and uh, with the Vitis vinifera, which had the better taste. So we're trying, to, we were trying to make a compromise to find a solution. And then they fell out of favor. Uh, however, with the climate change, hybrids are becoming more popular again. And there's a lot of research center in France, in Germany, in Switzerland that have currently developed new grapes called cépage résistant. So they're the new wave of hybrids, if you want. And those hybrids uh, are now being allowed in some of the appellations. Uh, it's controversial, uh, but many are looking at those hybrids for solution. Uh, before I introduce the four speakers uh, to talk about uh, hybrids, I would like to introduce uh, Magdalena Kaiser, the Director of Public Relations from the Wine Marketing Association, Association of Ontario. Uh, they are the sponsor today, and Magdalena would like to say a few words. Thank you, Michelle. We're so excited to be here and congratulations on an amazing uh, conference. Uh, VQA Wines is really excited to sponsor this particular session. Uh, the early 1970s is really kind of the beginning of the modern history of Ontario's wine industry. And at that time, we really focused on vinifera uh, to be the core part of our wine uh, agriculture. But we really had the foresight, interestingly, to see that hybrids was also a certain amount of hybrids, actually eight hybrids, that were part of the law that was put in place into the Appalachian system on those varieties. And interestingly, uh, one of those varieties, Vidal, uh, produces really Ontario's most expensive wine. So what we see now is hybrids and uh, our speaker from our community, our wine community in Ontario, Matt Speck, will be speaking on many of these things. It's really interesting to see how these different hybrids uh, played such an important role and continue to play an important role to your point that things are changing, things are evolving. Consumers are looking at things differently when it comes to hybrids. And uh, we think this is an important topic with respect to climate change. So we're really excited about today's session. Thank you for letting us be part of this and uh, looking forward to the topics. Thank you so much, Magdalena. I thank you so much for your support. Really appreciate it. Uh, so today, joining us for the conversation on hybrids, we have Matthew Specht. Matt and his brothers, Paul and Daniel, planted the original vineyards and began the business development of Henry of Pelham Family Estate Winery with their father in 1984. In 1992, Matt assumed the role of viticultural manager and senior vice president and has continued to develop Henry of Pelham into one of the leading national growers and producers of fine wines from Niagara. 
Matt currently manages the wineries production, which includes 300 acres of estate-owned vineyards in the Short Hills Bench sub-appellation. He also oversees the purchase of grapes from many of the finest independent growers-owned vineyards throughout Niagara. We'll talk about hybrids, of course, but what's interesting with Henry and Fellum is one of their flagship wine is Baco Noir. It's been very successful. It is one of their uh, top wines. All the way from Vermont, uh, Deirdre Hicken. Uh, Deirdre is a vigneron and she's the co-preparator of La Garagista with her husband, Caleb Barber. Deirdre farms and makes wines and cider in Chateauguay Mountains and the Champlain Valley. In addition to wine growing and making, Deirdre is also a writer and a photographer. She has authored three books and currently she's working on a fourth book about the world of hybrid grapes varieties in a quickly changing environment. Deirdre is very passionate about the regeneration of the land, the natural world of the vineyard and how that work translates into the shepherding process of making wine with art. And Deirdre uh, is extremely passionate about hybrids and she will share with us uh, her commitment to hybrids and why it, it is suited to Vermont. From Quebec, Michael Marler. Uh, Michael Marler uh, knew what he wanted to make wine uh, from his professions and in 1995 during exchange in the south of France. We're very lucky to have him in, uh, in Quebec. At, at some point of time he thought he was going to make wine in France and luckily he was pulled back by the, by the warmth of, of Quebec and came back here. And uh, he studied agriculture at McGill University and he is a pioneer in Chardonnay production and also biodynamic viticulture in Quebec. Michael and his wife Véronique Hupin established Domaine Les Pervenches in Farnham, Quebec in 2000, making organic wines that express the character of their land. And I would add to this that today, uh, you know, they have become a reference in Quebec uh, with so many years of experience. People in Quebec go to Michael and Véronique often to seek advice. It's going to be interesting to talk to Michael today as he has um, hybrids, but also, also Vitis vinifera, so he'll be able to share with us uh, his thought about Vitis vinifera versus hybrids. And all the way from Alto Adige with us are Max Morandel, a winemaker, and Julian Morandel, director of sales and marketing uh, of Lisoleoff. I hope I've pronounced this properly. Uh, I'm very excited to have Max and Julian with us. Their father, Werner Morandel, uh, started producing wines from resistant varieties in the 2000s. And when we talk about resistant varieties, those are cépage résistant, the, the recent waves of hybrids that were developed by Research Center. So now, 20 years later, uh, their best sellers are from Peewee varieties. They will be able to explain us what is Peewee. Uh, and they believe in the future of the plant vines, which um, they don't need any spring or very little. Uh, their father was the vice president of the Peewee International Association for many years, and now uh, they have taken over the uh, Peewee Aldo Adige uh, section. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And um, just as a reminder for people who are attending, uh, we have a chat box. Uh, so if you have questions for the panelists, uh, please put your question. I will be monitoring the questions and making sure that at the end, uh, we answer those questions uh, during the panel discussion. Matthew, uh, so we, we see Matthew a bit of an angle because uh, they have a big uh, bell uh, power outage in Ontario. So uh, he drove quickly to, the, to, the, to a house not very far from the winery. So um, I'm glad that you're here with us. And I'm excited for you to share some of the history and your experience with hybrids in Ontario, especially Baco Noir. Well, thank you, Michelle. Uh, <laughs> I'm really, really um, excited to be a part of this. Of this conference um, has to be a part of it. Hybrids are something that are definitely near and dear to our heart at Henry Appellum. They're a big part of our uh, of our production and our history and our success as a winery. Um, without going over too much of the history that Magdalena touched on, but I think it's you know, to understand hybrids' current role in Ontario and in with Henry Appellum. I think it's a, it's it's important to understand a bit of the history of where they've come from. 
uh, in the 20, in the 19th century, the, the wine industry goes back quite a ways in, in Ontario and it, back to the 19th century, it was primarily a Labrusca based industry. And by the early 20th century, it was still Labrusca based, but starting the hybrid started to play a role. And by the mid 20th century, most of the vineyards have been converted over to hybrid based vineyards, um, but still primarily for uh, more commercial, popular priced uh, wines. Um, there really wasn't a premium industry at that time. And so, so somewhere around the mid, mid 20th century, you have a half a dozen large commercial producers making really popular priced wines, um, but also in a protected market. There was a, a tariff protected market. Um, and it was uh, just sort of a bit of a, um, an insular industry at the time. Uh, fast forward to the 1980s, and this is where our role as a winery also comes into play. We've been around, we started planting our vineyards in 1984. By the 1980s, you have some, um, the beginnings of, the, of what's now the current kind of premium wine industry, a state wine-based industry. So a number of small independent growers starting to plant vineyards and, and uh and uh, with the intention of making really premium estate wines. Um, along with that, you get uh, really very significant um, uh, part of Canadian history, which was the negotiating of a free trade agreement with the United States. That's in 1988. And really that you can look at as a real inflection point in our industry where um, with the negotiating of that agreement, all the protections and tariffs are dropped. And uh, that commercial wine industry that was primarily based around kind of inexpensive, popular priced hybrid based wines is no longer protected, has to compete freely now with the, with the world, the entire world of, of wine production. Um, and it leads to a massive change in consolidation in the industry. So six large producers ultimately get consolidated into two remaining commercial producers. Um, but then along with that, you have this other unrelated but other trend happening um, which is these small independent growers and estate wineries out planting vineyards and striving to produce premium uh, estate wines and um, primarily a vinifera based industry those these are mostly vinifera classic chardonnay pinot noir riesling cabernet franc uh, going into the ground uh, with the intention of producing premium wines and there's a bunch of us. We were one of the early uh, ones in that group, but there was a dozen or so uh, initially, and then many, many more to follow. Um, and uh, with in the same year of free trade, 1988, our industry also established the VQA, an appellation system. And so you have these two kind of conflicting or coinciding events of uh, the market being opened up but also an appellation system being de developed uh, with the intention of protecting and allowing for premium wine production. And really what that time was primarily vinifera based wine production. So fast forward through the eighties. Now you get the consolidating of that commercial industry, but the blossoming of this independent um, uh, state winery uh, industry of which now there's over 200, I believe independent wineries. Uh, they're primarily vinifera based run classic vinifera varieties. Um, and that was, that was really the, but within the VQA, we allowed for hybrids to still have a role. And uh, what was interesting in there, while vinifera was definitely the focus of the industry to sort of establish itself as this premium, you know, globally competitive wine industry. We also had the hybrids still playing their role, like, and, and uh, Magdalena touched on it, Vidal Ice Wine, the most recognized, like highly regarded, arguably internationally regarded wine from our industry was made from a hybrid, it's made from Vidal. And um, you fast forward into our, our history as a winery, we, we planted uh, a number of, of wines, a number of grapes back in the 80s, because we really didn't know, you know, what would work, what would be successful. We planted a mixture of hybrids and vinifera. Um, uh, and, um, you know, it's interesting. I'd love to tell a story where we had some wonderful grand master plan uh, to where we decided to plant back on Noir along with Pinot Noir and Cabernet Franc and all these other varieties. And then the rest is history, is successful history. But 
really was it was more a trial and error and really a, a somewhat of an accidental uh, discovery of uh, you know, what works and what didn't work in our vineyards. And um, the story of Back on Awar for us is, is, is really kind of one of just really mostly really listening to our customers. So it was interesting. We planted um, a number of hybrids. Some were successful, some weren't. Planted, of course, the classic varieties, you know, Noir, Chardonnay. And my brothers and I, as you know, we were young at the time, we would go, we made our wines and we'd go out to wine tastings. And we'd, we'd pour the various wines we made. And, you know, universally, we had the most uh, positive response to our back on a war. People just really liked it. Customers liked it. And, um, you know, in the wine industry, this is, you know, we, we, we were often very produce production focused we want to make you know we're worried about how we're growing the grapes and making and the production side of things of course is super important not when we can be always coming at things from that perspective and and we need to obviously that's important but uh the history of backhoe for us is really one of the opposite it was very much customer driven we would be pour our wines and that was the one that people liked the best and um some of it, it was interesting it was I say accidental in the sense that we were growing back when Awar and these other hybrids, we didn't, weren't distinguishing in our vineyards, treating the hybrids differently from the vinifera. We were treating them with the same kind of care and, and uh, with the same diligence that we would treat Pinot Noir and these more sensitive varieties. But we didn't really know any better. We just thought we'd, we want to make a great wine with all the grapes that we have and um, as good a wine as possible. And uh you know, the prevailing wisdom of the day back then was that hybrids really only had a kind of commercial role as a filler into these sort of more blended wines. And they didn't really have a role in the premium, maybe outside of ice wine, didn't really have a premium place in the premium wine business. Um, but honestly, we were young, it's pretty naive, and we, we grew all our grapes the same. We treated back on Noir with the same care that we treated Pinot Noir, and we put it in, you know, nice new... Uh, in this case, American oak barrels that were very robust and given a great spicy character. And um, we went out and poured it to customers and people people really liked it. People loved it. And, and that continues on to today. We pour our wines all around the world. Backo represents about a third of our production. We've got 100 acres in production. We have 200 acres of other really all vinifera-based varieties as well. We make a, a wide range of wines. Um, but interesting enough, when we go to, it's not just a local phenomena for us, when we go out to the international wine market, where we sell wine in, in uh, about 25 uh, markets outside of Canada, um, Back on Noir is, always ends up being their number one seller in those markets. And it's just purely, uh, I think it's, you know, the wine, people like the taste of it. They like it, the quality of the wine. But I think another part of this that's inter is the, it's different as a place to differentiate itself from other wines uh, and, and, you know, massive international wine market. And, um, I think that's also part of its success. Um, so, I mean, for us, you know, with this started back in the early eighties, we, we were having some success with Baco and we just really chose to embrace it uh, wholeheartedly plant and really do that much more work in the vineyards and with our vinification to push as far as we could the, the level of the quality of the wine and um and of course then with the marketing and presentation of the wine as well and uh the rest it really has been a success story um you know, replay back i mean that's our role with back back the industry as a whole though hybrids still do play this this significant role in our industry they're about a third of the industry's production um and they still fill this kind of dual role they fill a role of because they're uh, less expensive to grow. They require they can require less inputs if you want to grow them for the more entry-level kind of popular priced wine segment. And a lot of hybrids are grown for that. Um, but then they also fill this role uh, in the this premium role um, for, for a state table wine, for Appalachian wines. And um, both sides are really growing, but actually interestingly enough, in the current world, it's the premium estate Appalachian wines that are that are growing the most, the fastest. Um, thanks, Matthew. I have a I have a few questions for you. So uh, that that choice of going for Bacot Noir, which was successful with consumers, 
Um, has it helped currently? Because back in the days, my understanding is the hybrids were helping for the cold, but now there's other disease pres pressures uh, happening more with climate change. As the choice of plant continuing to, to, to grow back home, has it helped you uh, or put you in a good position today with the challenge of climate change and more disease pressure? Yeah, so it's just so yeah, thank you for bringing it around to the to the core of the topic of this this panel and then your your discussion. Yeah, so I, I I say kind of it's like an accidental success story in some ways for us because um yes, it does. So yeah, now in this current world we're we're much more mindful um now than we probably than we were back back then in the 80s of uh of climate change and and there's been, you know, sustainability. We we're, we're, we we operate under the sustainable winemaking um, umbrella in, in in Ontario, Canada. It's a system we've developed. Uh, um, but our, the the hybrids are lend themselves to that. Yeah, they 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 require less. They're just more mildew resistant. They they require less of these inputs. Um, and so and they're, I mean, the, the the same reasons that they were planted back in the '80s. They, they they're they're cold resistant. They're disease resistant. They're always viewed, they're, they're kind of the workhorse vines for an area like ours, where we have some extreme weather, we get cold winters, we can get some rain when we don't want it. I mean, it's a, it can be a tricky place to grow grapes here in Niagara. We get sort of all four seasons and we have, we have to adapt to those and the hybrids adapt well to it. So the initial role of hybrids was to adapt to a climate that we have here that's already can be kind of volatile, but now in this new environment of climate change and, and the push for more sustainability, that uh, those attributes of the hybrids fit into that world uh, perfectly. They, they are that much more resistant. I have a question from someone there in, in that regard. So how do you compare the amount of inputs in your Baco Noir vineyards with the amount of inputs of Pinot Noir? Yeah, I mean, to quantify, I mean, um, if I were to math it out, say just in dollars, would be one way, like dollars per acre, say be one measure, I guess you could look at that. There's a number of ways you could, that could be a long discussion <laughs> depending on how technically you want to get. But we would, you know, in, in, in dollars per acre, which is one way to measure how much inputs you put into a vineyard, we would run about 60 some odd percent uh, of the cost per acre, which and that's capturing things like, um, all the things the inputs that you'd have to do which would include spraying and all those things so about 35 to 40 percent less would be just a very broad strokes way to do it say in terms of dollars um if you really specifically drilled into the need for for fungicide just dealing with with mildews and, and insect control it's less than that you can you, they you just are that much more resistant particularly to mildews. so it'd be less than half in terms of those specific inputs. It's interesting also, Matthew, because, um, you know, from uh, once upon the time, there was a pushback of including hybrids into VQA, into the Appalachian uh, system in Ontario. And now you have recently allowed a market into uh, the VQA. Uh, can you share with us uh, why the market uh, got the, the, the green the green light to, to be accepted yeah. into the Appalachian in, in Ontario. Yeah, it's interesting, but I mean, I think it goes back to, you have, it has to be looked at in the context of our history. And when, when VQA was first established in 1988, you know, we were coming from an industry that had been Labrusca based and hybrid based and didn't, there wasn't a premium wine industry. And so I think, you know, we were part of the founding of that, of that system with, with a number of other early adopters and, and, and with the intention of a premium industry. And we felt we needed to put a foot in a stake in the ground with Benefera and classic varieties. And of course we did. Um, I think in recent years with the confidence, it comes, it comes with the confidence of our industry where we, we, we make these wines, we grow Pinot Noir, we grow the, a lot, many of the classic varieties and we've established wine styles uh, that are um, legitimate and we're confident in these wine styles uh, of our terroir with, with those classic varieties. That I think the my opinion of the industry is now gaining a little more confidence to say these other varieties are also really interesting. Um, I'm, and there's there's a, a world of these hybrids. Hybrids are in a in a in a renaissance. We're in a, into a, a new a renaissance of hybrids again, 
who would have thought you wouldn't have predicted it back um, in the in the 1980s because there were it was the opposite trend they were being really removed at a at a, at a mass a vast scale but i think our industry you know has gained its own confidence in our in in what we do here the confidence in our terroir and the wines that we can make with classic varieties of course but then these hybrids are really interesting like they make they can make very interesting wines and I think it's listening to our customers ultimately with this, this confidence and saying, well, customers like these ones. They're customers, they're customers for these wines. They like them. They're interesting. And what can we do more to evolve this and develop you know, what, what more work can be done here to, to exploit this, this interest. And so Marquette is one of that Marquette. There's a, there's competing hybrids looking for a, uh, a spot in our Appalachian system and there's a vetting process uh, and the, they have to be proved to be a quality wine, which is tricky because <laughs> that's subjective as well. But you know, they have to prove to be a quality wine and to make a quality wine consistently. And it took a while. It was a long process for a new variety like Marquette to 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 get Appalachian status. But I think it's really exciting because it's the beginning of this. I think we're at the beginning of this renaissance. Before we go on with Deirdre, uh, do you foresee this um this trend of accepting hybrids into VQA to grow and are you seeing more hybrids planted now in Ontario? Is it coming back in popularity? Yes. Yeah, they are. Yes. So there's uh, um, about a half a dozen or maybe it's eight varieties that are, that are allowed right now. Uh, there are others that are in that process of trying to vetting themselves through Um, as much as that, though, there's, a, there's, there's some planting of the ex existing varieties. Back on War is being planted quite, uh, is, is growing quite quickly. I believe in the last uh, less than 10 years, the, the sale, the volume of Appalachian um, varietal back on War has more than doubled. And that's not slowing down. It's one of the fastest growing single varietals, period, actually, in, in, our, in our liquor distribution system, the LCBO. Um, New varietals, yeah, there's definitely work. There's some other air, Appalachian areas outside of Niagara where, where we're based, which is the larger, largest growing area in Ontario. But there's some of these other uh, smaller growing regions that are climatically you know, colder, have some other challenges that are working on, that are embracing hybrids also, um, and new ones. So, it, it, but it takes time. In the wine industry, everything moves really slowly because <laughs> they're planting vineyards and waiting and making wine over years and years. There's no fast way to, to accelerate that. It's, um, I think it's an organic process that's happening and it is gaining momentum. And I think it's, yeah, there's an exciting future there that's developing for sure. Thank you, Matthew. We'll, we'll come back at the end for the panel discussion. This is a great introduction. And you're talking about Renaissance. And we have with us uh, Deirdre Riken from La Garagista, who has, her wines have a big, big following with sommelier. Uh, hybrids have become trendy again with sommelier and uh, with geeks, wine geeks. And, you know, uh, I certainly know that your wines are often hand up on a table. Uh, sommelier loves your wine and you've been championing hybrids Uh, since the beginning and we've had a lot of discussion in the last uh, year when I was writing my book I was doing interviews with you so I'm glad to have you here and if you could share with us your story and why you think that hybrids are good for Vermont for now but also for the future. Yes uh, thank you Michelle and thank you Matthew for such a great Uh, dive into the history of Ontario wines and how Baco Noir in particular has been uh, such a crucial member of uh, what kinds of wines that you're making there. And it uh, gives me a really great jumping off point to talk about how uh, cold climate hybrids have become an integral part of the uh, identity of uh, Vermont wine now and what I think Vermont wine is going to be in the future. Um, you know, Vermont, uh, hybrids for Vermont are appropriate kind of for obvious reasons. <laughs> It's cold here. Uh, so, you know, looking to cold climate varieties like a natural uh, choice. Um, But also, I think that uh, we have really benefited from 
the history of other regions, you know, places like Ontario, places like Quebec, um, other places in the United States, where people started wine or wine regions began uh, before ours. I mean, we are a very, very new wine region. Um, but people who began planting long before us and kind of the trials and tribulations that they've all gone through and places in particular that were considered fringe wine regions, which when Vermont started was uh, considered a fringe wine area. Uh, I think that is has changed now and continues to change, which is exciting. Uh, but we we really benefited uh, from being able to see the successes and uh, the mistakes that other regions, I think, made in the past and how other places have developed. And as a consequence, when Vermont started to think about planting, which was in the late 90s, um, we had access to these cold hardy varieties um, that people were able to do a lot of research and in places like Cornell and the Uni University of Minnesota who were really uh, important in our evolution with wine. Uh, they were able to provide information and research and people who wanted to plant here were able to dig down into that research and really think about with a lot of forethought about what would be appropriate to plant here. And I think that's always the crux of the question for any new and burgeoning wine region is what are the appropriate varieties for that region? And we're in a position where we have absolutely no rules. <laughs> um, you know, to hear about what went on in Ontario in 88, you know, rules started to develop. You know, we still have, um, you know, our AVA is Vermont. You know, there are no approved varieties for here. We can plant, you know, whatever we want. And so therefore there's a lot of experimentation with what we are planting here. Um, I think I'd like to also backtrack just a moment uh, to talk about kind of how we got here for uh, working with hybrids. And that's looking at our more short and sweet history. But I think there's some important things that happened in Vermont food culture that led us to this place. And, you know, I think Vermont has been uh, known as an agricultural state, as an agricultural region for, for forever, uh, for as long as Vermont has existed. And, uh, you know, we've gone from having a history in the 19th century with sheep to dairy farming in the 1900s and, uh, you know, the 21st century. And like other Northern states here in the U.S., we, um, Dairy farming, dairy cows have been a very important part of the agricult agricultural paradigm. And if we go back to the 70s, there started to be a breakdown in the dairy farm paradigm. Uh, the market conditions started to affect dairy farmers very negatively. Uh, they couldn't make a living. They couldn't put food on their table. They couldn't keep their land in the family. They couldn't pay their taxes. So there were a lot of questions and concerns about what was happening to Vermont agriculturally. And farmers and the agricultural agencies and the people who lived here who wanted to support the agricultural story here, they began to look at other ideas and concepts, other paradigms, other crops, other livestock, in which Vermont farmers could um, explore uh, and, developed, and develop what became sort of considered as this value added agricultural product. So instead of just having a dairy farm where you were just producing milk, uh, which couldn't support, it wasn't sustainable for the farm, was there something else that could come out of that process? And because dairy farms were a, a big part of what was happening here, a logical extension or a logical conclusion was to look at 
cheese, to look at artisanal cheese. So dairy farms began to implement this model of also producing artisanal cheese. And that started to happen in the late 80s, early 90s. And it became a very, very, very successful model. Uh, I think now Vermont is considered, you know, 30 years later, one of the uh, best regions in the world for producing cheese. So the agricultural community, seeing that what, what had happened with cheese, uh, began to also look at other options, other crops. And uh, at the same time that that was happening, um, agriculture was taking a change here in Vermont. Uh, a lot of young people were moving. We had kind of a second wave of back to the land movement. Uh, the CSA movement was starting, so community supported agriculture. Farmers markets were burgeoning. Uh, restaurants were becoming more sophisticated. Um, they were burgeoning. So we had this really vibrant, lively food culture that started to happen in the 90s. And I think you find whenever a region has a food culture that's developing, a wine culture or fermented beverage culture starts to develop too. So things like craft beer began to develop here, cider. Uh, and then, of course, people started to look at wine. But the big question was, wine, Vermont? Vermont's cold, but wine, can we, we, can't, we can't grow Cabernet here. Um, but fortunately for, for us and for those people who were having those thoughts about what's this next crop that we could pursue, uh, there had been so much research done by places like Cornell and the University of Minnesota uh, developing and breeding hybrid varieties that would adapt beautifully in a climate like ours. So I am very thankful to those uh, that first wave of producers. I sort of feel like we have three waves of producers here in Vermont now. We have the first wave who put in the infrastructure. They made this decision to commit to hybrid varieties because the reality was we couldn't grow, we couldn't grow vinifera, um, but we had these really interesting hybrid varieties we could pursue. And then we had a second wave of producers, which I would consider myself a part of. And those were people um, not just who wanted to help uh, keep land in agriculture and find sustainable ways of uh, taking care of the land. But we were also people who loved wine and we could marry this idea of agriculture and wine together and start to um, give, as Matthew was saying, the same amount of attention, of attention and care that somebody in you know, a Grand Cru vineyard might give to their vines, we could do that with our hybrids. And if we did that, what would happen? What kinds of wines could we produce here? And that has been a really exciting journey because there, there is so much possibility and there's so much, um, there's so many interesting things I think that are coming out of the varieties that we're working with here. And then I think now we're in this period of a third wave where we have another group of young producers coming to the state because they're looking at places to make wine. And traditionally they might've gone to California, they might've gone to Oregon, but they're looking at climate. And the fact that these places are in climate crisis, uh, not just change. And they think, I, I can't have longevity producing wine. Uh, in a place like that. So what other places in the United States can I produce wine? And because Vermont has been doing some really wonderful and special work with hybrids, I think, um, and with the farming of them, people have started to look to Vermont as a model of what's possible uh, and what kind of potential there is in terms of climate. Um, and what's happening ecologically and environmentally. So we're having this wave of very young people come who want to uh, put down their roots here and they want to work with hybrids, which is super exciting. And uh, I, I'm particularly excited about how we can continue to develop this model for other regions of putting together farming 
and the hybrids, not only for places who might be considered fringe and only, only be able to work with hybrids right now, but also integrating hybrids into more temperate wine regions that have typically only focused on vinifera. And I think we're now at this moment where people have to start looking at what kinds of varieties are growing where and what's appropriate for their region. And as Matthew was saying, we're in a renaissance of the hybrid because I think they are going to be really, really important and crucial in um, how we move forward in terms of, of climate and environment. Um, thanks, Deirdre. So uh, I know your property and I know your wine really well, but many people don't, listening here have questions for you because they don't know which grapes you plant. Can you just maybe share with yes. them the grapes that you have planted? And then I have a, a couple questions for you. Yes, of course. So we are currently growing Marquette, which is, uh, as Matthew was saying, is approved Ontario. Uh, we grow a, a white grape called La Crescent. We grow three different kinds of Frontenac, uh, Frontenac Noir, Blanc, and Gris. Uh, Frontenac you can find in Quebec. Uh, we also grow Saint Croix. Uh, we have a variety called Brianna. And those are grapes that I personally grow. But also you can find in Vermont things like um, Louise Swenson, uh, Verona, and... Uh, Petit Pearl, uh, and there's a lot of experimentation uh, at other vineyards here with places like the University of Minnesota and Cornell who are constantly breeding new varieties. So there are test sites uh, in other vineyards within the state, um, which is pretty exciting too. Can you touch base a little bit about the disease pressure? Because you and I have had this discussion before and I have it in my book, actually. It was astonishing how little copper you have to use because you're a biodynamic producer. Uh, and yes. you, you were saying how you think that the hybrids, uh, in combination with the practices that you do in the vineyards and the preparation, minimize the use of copper. And you were telling me it was something like 60 milligram per year. Is this correct? Uh, oh, yes, you're going to make me do metric. Um, <laughs> In, uh, let's see, in ounces, in ounces, it's uh, it's like 60 ounces uh, a season. I mean, it's a very, very small amount. And we did a really interesting um, research project with Cornell. Uh, it wasn't planned. It just it kind of worked out this way because we are working with uh, rotational grazing with sheep, and copper is toxic for sheep. So. Uh, we wanted to be sure that um, the homeopathic amounts of copper and sulfur that we implement into our biodynamic program, uh, that that was going to be okay for, for the sheep. So we did first a soil test, and uh, the um, lab there said, okay, well, this is kind of unbelievable, but you have very, very, very little copper in your soil. There's uh, we don't really quite understand what's going on. So can we please now do a forage test uh, to make sure that the numbers are reading correctly? So we collected forage from each of the vineyards. We did the lab analysis and they said, okay, well, this is kind of amazing because if you're going to have sheep for any period of time on your land, you are actually going to have to add copper into their diet. There's so little copper in your forage and soil. And I know that, you know, Copper is, has become a villain in viticulture. And I think that's largely because people are using these very large doses to combat fungal diseases. Whereas I think it's very possible with hybrids, you can use very minimal or homeopathic, homeopathic doses along with other plant-based um, uh, fermentations or teas and as a consequence, they are not degrading the soil in a way that analysis had shown copper was degrading the soil in the past. And I think, you know, that again, that has to do with moderation and how much we're using. Uh, and hybrids definitely allow us to uh, look at that equation 
and uh, really dial those things back. Um, and in some in some areas, I think you know not having to use those things at all, you know, being able to rely only on plant based teas rather than mineral based sprays. More questions for you, but we'll we'll wait at the end so we have a chance to everyone to speak and uh, we'll we'll have a panel discussion after. Okay. Thank you, Thank Dindri. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and then we go to, to Michael Muller from Les Pervenches, and uh, I've had also a lot of discussion with, with Michael in, in the last year, and uh, I wanted someone who worked with both Vitis vinifera and uh, hybrids. And what's interesting with Mike is that uh, a lot of people in Quebec are embracing the hybrids. You still have them, but you actually pulled out some hybrids to go back to Vitis vinifera. So your, your, your view is a bit different, which I think is also always important when we have a discussion to have a uh, two, two point of, of view on that. Uh, so if you could share maybe our, your experience with hybrids and vitis vinifera in Quebec. Sure. So, uh, well, thank you very much. And thank you, Deirdre, and thank you, Matthew, for your uh, conference. It's very, very interesting. I'm a little nervous because after your conference, Deirdre, that mine's going to kind of sound like the total opposite. but. Um, I guess that's, uh, it's a reality. So that's what I'm going to talk about today is the reality that uh, happened at Les Parvenches over the last 22 years. So it was my 22nd harvest this year. I co-own it with my wife, Veronique, and uh, we are organic and biodynamic certified. And um, before we start talking about basically why I go into what I want to talk about, I want to talk about a bit about definitions about hybrids because Matthew, you talked about Baco, Deirdre, you talked more about La Crescent. Uh, just to make it clear to everybody that we're talking about sort of two different um, uh, places from where the hybrids come from. And I kind of see the, what we plant in Quebec in three different, uh, different categories. We would have Vitis vinifera, then we'd have what we call the French hybrids, which would be Seval, Vidal, Baco, Foch. And then you'd have the Minnesota hybrids, which Deirdre were talking about, which are Frontenac and La Crescent and Marquette and Petit Belle. So I think if while I'm talking, if I refer to hybrids, I'm talking about the Minnesota hybrids. I'm kind of going to put the French hybrids and the viniferous together because in our climate, they both need to be covered all the time or they don't produce. In Quebec, we get down below minus 30. So uh, most of the French hybrids and the vinifera obviously won't survive the winters. And that's one of the reasons why we go a lot of uh, Minnesota hybrids in Quebec. So the main reason as it was for Deirdre and Vermont is that we grow a lot of Frontenac and Marquette and La Crescent and those varieties in Quebec because everything else will die, uh, basically, if we don't cover them. So that comes to talk about the, the hardiness of these uh, varieties. Now, we talk about the hardiness of the hybrids, so the Minnesota hybrids, at being close to minus 30, minus 32, down to minus 33. Um, but you have to understand that is a, the, the, in the peak, or not the peak, but let's say the trough of winter. And with the climate change and we're getting more erratic weather, we've in 2000, and I can't remember exactly the, the years, but I think it was 18 and 19, we were getting minus 20 temperatures on the 20th of November, and that actually was damaging the uh, hybrids. And so we were realizing, now we've been growing hybrids in Quebec for uh, over 20 years now, that these varieties had a very erratic uh, production level. So some years you'd have great production and some years you'd have low production. Uh, and we're talking about primary bud survival basically for that production. But at the same time, we were having trunk problems. And I think that both in Ontario and maybe Vermont, you have the same problems that you have to renew the trunks because the winter cold will split the trunks and then you can have crown gall in them. And so you have to, well, what happens there is sometimes you don't see the damage and then you get a lowering of productivity and a lowering of vine health because of the cracking in the, uh, in the trunk. So you have to renew the vineyard. Well, that's a practice, but it also influences the sort of erratic production that we can see across the board in Quebec on these varieties. Uh, so the solution to, these, to, these, uh, to this erratic production is either that people are planting more surface area uh, to compensate for the lower yields on a bad year, or as we're seeing a lot of, is that they're starting to cover the hybrids so that they have a more, um, a more homogeneous production every year. So those are the solutions that we're doing in Quebec to, um, to compensate for the erratic production of uh, the Minnesota hybrids. I decided to pull them out and planted them with Pinot Noir, but that's a whole another story. 
Um, let's talk about uh, disease pressure. Um, I've heard, you know, Matthew, you talked about some. Deirdre, you talked about some of the the amount we can limit in using, you know, the sprays for uh, fungal diseases. Um, so I've had Frontenac for 15 years. I had uh, Sabrebois. I've had Bacon Noir. I have Fidal. I have Seval. I've had Foch, and I've had six other Minnesota varieties on the property. We've only kept Seval. But my personal experience, and before coming to talk, uh, at the, uh, you know, to sit down and think about the conference, I sat down with some agronomes and I spoke with other producers. And we came to the figure that to bring in a crop, um, if you're aiming for a disease-free crop at harvest year in, year out, that it would take about uh, 20 to 25% less spray in general. And we're talking insect if it's for insects or for fungal diseases, on the hybrids, the Minnesota hybrids, compared to the French hybrid and vinifera varieties. So there is definitely a gain. So if we look at hybrids, in their winter hardy, they're obviously going to be more sustainable in the long term if we can keep that production less erratic. But in our climate at the moment, we're not getting it. And, uh, but, and it's also to look at the disease pressure side, gaining 20 25% is really, really important. So if you're looking at hybrids, you can definitely think about keying into those numbers. At least that's the experience we've had. Um, so that sort of brings you to know, talk about the field. Let's talk about the seller. What, uh, one of the reasons why Veronique and I, my wife, decided to go almost all vinifera. So we grow Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, the Wurzstraminer, Zweigelt, and uh, there's another one in there, but uh, uh, Chardonnay, of course. And uh, but we have a hectare of Seval. So three hectares of the vinifera and one hectare of Seval. What's happening, what happened in the winery when we were using the Minnesota hybrids is that the problem was the winemaking parameters that we were coming, that the grapes, that the juice was at in comparison to the vinifera. So for example, if we have on, uh, let's say nine out of 10 years, our average vinifera parameters are uh, about a 10.5 to 13 potential alcohol level with an acidity level in tartaric equivalents between seven and 10.5. However, when we bring in the hybrids, we might have a slightly higher sugar level on average, but we're dealing with acidity levels, which are probably between, or we were, not probably, between 11 and 12 grams up to, you know, 18 and 19 on some of the Frontenacs on some years. Obviously, there, you know, I know that there are some hybrids out there that are, go below that, but I'm talking in general what we see with the hybrids that are planted in Quebec, that they're sitting in that acidity level, and that acidity level is about twice that we bring in the viniferas at. So we make wines without any uh, additives at all, 95%. We do use a little sugar to make bubblies, um, but we're talking 90% of our production is used without any ingredients at all. So there's no sugar, there's no acidity adjustments. And so the vinifera parameters were perfect for what we wanted to do. So we decided that with the erratic production that we were having, and the winemaking parameters that the vinifera were getting that we were gonna concentrate more on growing vinifera. And with our covering systems and our pruning systems, we have very, very regular and quite high levels of cropping uh, with the vinifera and we're very satisfied with those. If I wanna talk about sustainability and the environment, um, just still playing the devil's advocate side here. Um, if, if, we took the, if we go back to the problem of, for example, the erratic production of the Minnesota hybrids, and we wanted to plant a little bit more surface area, let's say one and a half to twice the size to compensate for the, the years where it's low. Well, because people are spraying, you know, per hectare, kilos per hectare on their vineyard, well, you just doubled your spray program to compensate for uh, lower productions that you're getting from the erratic production of the Minnesota hybrid. So it, in a certain sense, if you have a great site with the right varieties, and that's what the key to viticulture is. Of course, you know, you're going to get away from this erratic production and the 100% gain in energy consumption in not having to cover your vines is, is great. Uh, and we should take advantage of it. But not all vineyards are planted on the best sites. It's only a small portion of them. So we do see this increase in surface area to compensate for the poor production levels on sun years, and therefore we're increasing our, the, the amount of spray that's happening on these vineyards. Um, the other thing is, is if, as I said, one of the solutions for the erratic production was to actually start covering the uh, hybrids. Well, then you're, you're kind of having the same problem because you're starting to cover the vines and all the energy, you know, that you're using to buy geotextiles and cover them um, takes away from the sustainability. So basically, I'd like to say in conclusion that, you know, 
we made those personal decisions according to the winemaking styles we wanted to make with those parameters and also evaluating how the vineyard was actually working in reality to the vinifera and uh, we are trying we all do uh, to be re reducing copper levels all the time and we do a lot of uh, herbal teas and that's one of our favorite things to work with and we're really passionate about that so we are reducing every year the spray levels just by learning and keeping our vineyards as healthy as possible. But if we compare sort of the vinifera to the Frontenac or the you know other varieties that we were growing, we weren't actually, it wasn't day and night with regards to disease protection. So if we come back to the wine, we just decided that, hey, what do we want to you know have be working with over the long term? And we decided for the vinifera. And just to conclude, there's no perfect variety if it's a hybrid or a vinifera. And any love terroir can shine. So I think that uh, there's a great wines that are made with hybrids. We just have to keep experimenting and making sure that the vineyards are loved and that they're in the right places. And a lot of what the hybrids can give will show more. Merci, Mike. Uh, there's a few questions. I have a, a question for you, but before, there's, a, there's someone asking here, um, they don't know Quebec uh, as well, uh, how much precipitation do you have uh, in your area in the growing season? Uh, that's very erratic too. Uh, it's been moving around so much within the last five years, but I would say that, you know, I'm looking at 100 millimeters of rain in June, which is a little bit less in July. Uh, May can be uh, an up and down, it can be all rain or not. So that really, you know, has a big effect on how the mildew is going to work. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, you could look at around 100 m mLs per, per month on average during the growing season. I don't think that would be wrong, but I don't have the, those numbers at hand and I'm sorry. Do you, um, you and I have talked before with the climate change, you're seeing some new mildew happening in the region. Mm -hmm. um, when you compare, let's say, Ceval and the other Vitis vinifera in your, in your vineyards, are, are the grapes reacting uh, the same way with the new mildew uh, appearing, or you find that the hybrids are a bit more resistant to it? I find that, uh, so we're talking about uh, Plasmapora viticola, and there's, uh, I think we're working with the Riparia variety and the vinifera, but there's also Aistivalis that sort of popped up in the last five years. What's interesting about this one is that you know you go in and do a, a normal sort of campaign against um, um, against mildew and you know and you get, come to flowering post flowering and everything's under control you're like oh yes it's finished and that's basically was the uh, the model from you know 2000 to 2016 and then in 2016 I remember I took a few days off from the vineyard and came back in mid September and Seval was white like it it had snowed and the vinifers were fine. Um, so in a certain sense, what was probably happening is there's a sl you have a slight uh, less disease mildew pressure on Seval. So there was probably one extra spray that was done probably post flowering on this, on the vinifers that protected against this ice development and the Seval's were completely defoliated. And so that surprised us from the beginning. And that's what we realized that uh, we were actually dealing with another cycle of mildew. And if to talk about ice Valis and talk about uh, hybrids and their disease resistance, I just want, I know I'm just trying to keep it, you know, clear. Um, we've not this year at, in the fall, for the first time, two vineyards in our area had Aistivalis, Frontenac had Aistivalis on the leaves. One was just a, uh, was confirmed by an agronome and the other one, and there was actually serious defoliation on, at the end of the season because of uh, Plasmapora viticola Aistivalis on Frontenac. So the, 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 what we've been work, talking about between growers and, um, and this might be something to think about, is that when you start planting a vineyard, if it's a vinifera vineyard or a hybrid vineyard in a, you know, a virgin spot that hasn't been growing vineyards, uh, that hasn't been growing vines there for a long time or ever, uh, there's going to be a grace period where there's really going to be very, very little disease that happens there. And that over the time, we see that actually the disease inoculum either develops or adapts in the soils, and we still have to see the varieties that were not at all uh, affected, being more affected after time. I mean, the same thing with the vinifera. I remember when we started back uh, in 2000 and, you know, we bought Les Pervenches in 2000 and we started planting more Chardonnay. We had a hectare, a half hectare when we bought. We started planting more in 2003. Uh, we would plant the vines and I wouldn't spray them for a season and a half, uh, you know, nothing. And there was no ever any problem. And then in 2017, we planted uh, some vinifera, some Zweigelt and, uh, you know, as soon as the leaves popped up, 
you know, two or three weeks after it was, it was white. I wasn't going to do anything to them. And then, then I said, oh, I'm going to have to really, really revise, you know, our strategy against that. So there is definitely change that's happening at the same time. So, I mean, you got to look at what we're saying today as a snapshot and, you know, at least realizing, and we all know this, that it's going to evolve. And one thing that we've seen evolve is certain diseases that weren't there before coming in both on vinifera and on the hybrids. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'll come back uh, to you. Uh, but before we have the panel discussion, uh, we are going to finish with uh, Julien Morandel and Max Morandel uh, from Lisa Hall. You can pronounce that for me, please, because you say it so beautifully. Yeah, good evening. It's called Lisa Leho. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I could not do that. Um, so I, I was kind of keen to have someone on the discussion from those newly developed hybrids, and your father really a adopted them. Um, and those are now your flagship wines at the winery. This is what you sell the most of, uh, are from those um, resistant grape. Uh, so perhaps before we, we start, can you explain to us what are resistant grape? How would you define cépage résistant? Uh, yeah, good evening, first of all. My name is Mike Julian. This is my uh, brother Julian. And we're very happy to be here on this international talk about um, the future, basically. So to answer your question, uh, resistant vines are basically um, vitis vinifera, so European vines that were uh, crossed with American wines, which were resistant to the um, the illnesses, the mildew, and so um, through decades and decades of uh, working in uh, research and doing these experiments um, in the research centers, uh, they were created the hybrid vines. Um. Yeah, and I just want maybe want to add something to that that's going to maybe help for the conversation. Uh, so the hybrids have been created to, to, to fight something, disease, cold, right, to, to resist to something. But there's this new wave of grapes being developed, who have been developed, some of them that you have planted, which are polygenic, right? So in the past, would create hybrids that would be monogenic, meaning they were meant to resist to one thing, whether it was cold or one specific disease. But what the centers, a research center, have been trying to do in the last years are develop polygenic uh, hybrids, meaning uh, they would take American species or Asian species with vitis vinifera and then cross that many more times with vinifera to have more of the taste of vinifera, but also resistant to multiple diseases in the hope that uh, the disease don't, uh, don't find their ways back, right? Because it's just, we, we know it with COVID, we have different mutation. Usually uh, the, um, the disease finds its way back when it's monogenic, right? So the, the focus in the past year with the research center uh, has been to develop those polygenic uh, and grapes. And some of them, you've kind of part of the wave of cépage résistant. So I just wanted to make clear because some of the grapes you have planted, they're fairly new, uh, newly developed. Exactly. And that's the, um, that was always the tough thing um, during these crossings or research that you have to produce a vine that is resistant, but first of all, has a really good taste. So the consumers like it at the beginning uh, when they did these crossings, maybe a lot of varieties were resistant, but they didn't uh, really taste very good. So the challenge was to um, produce a resistant vine that is, let's say, very resistant, which you do not have to spray with copper or sulfur, um, and at the same time um, makes a, a brilliant wine then in the glass. That was the biggest challenge. Um, so first of all, I would like to uh, tell you more about our company, uh, how it was uh, founded, uh, what our father ba basically did with the um, resistant varieties and why he uh, chose that path. And then my brother Julian will explain to you more the economic side of um, selling uh, resistant uh, wines on the markets. So um, our father bought um, the land in 1993 and started planting vines. Basically, it was all Vitis renifera. It was uh, Chardonnay, Merlot, uh, Gewürztraminer, Pinot Blanc, Cabernet Sauvignon. And um, he always um, uh, had the organic approach. So he basically uh, started producing those wines using organic methods. 
So spraying uh, copper and sulfur, because here the mildew pressure is quite high where we live. It's uh, Northern Italy, so we have a lot of uh, warm days and nights, but we also have uh, quite a bit of rain. We're not a very dry area like Sicily or Puglia or Rome or those areas. We're in the middle of the Alps, close to the Austrian and Swiss border. So we have around 700 to 900 millimeters of um, rainfall per year. So um, during the 90s and the early 2000s, our father realized that um, even though he was using organic methods, he had to spray his Chardonnay or Merlot or Cabernet Sauvignon up to 15 or even 18, 20 times um, per season, per year. So that's when he um, was looking for a different approach in viticulture and found uh, the resistant varieties in the city of Freiburg in Germany. Uh, us being the most northern region in Italy, uh, we don't have the language barrier to Austria, Germany, because here we're bilingual. Everyone who lives here speaks German and Italian. So for us, it was very easy to find this connection to southern Germany and import the resistant uh, vines in the early 2000s. So we started planting the first um, uh, vineyards actually in Italy um, with resistant vines in 2002. Uh, the company is situated on 500 meters above sea level. So that's where most of our vi uh, vines grow. Uh, on, uh, we're on a hill um, facing southeast. So we get a lot of sun and uh, wind from the south from Verona, Lake Garda, uh, northern Italian area. Uh, so the conditions are, are quite, are quite um, favorable for wine production. And then we started in 2002, now 20 years later almost, 90% of our production is um, resistant wine production. And we specialized on five or six uh, resistant grapes. They're called Solaris, Brona, Johannita, Souvenir Gris, Merlot Chorus, and Divico. I'll write it in the chat um, in a few minutes so you can all check out uh, the var varieties. I'm sure many of you know them already. And our experience is um, a very positive experience with these varieties um, because due to the sun and wind we have, the quite sunny climate um, with the resistant varieties, we can actually produce wines and uh, by not spraying at all. Like in, in good years or in most years, we don't um, do any treatments in our vineyards. Last summer, also this summer, for example, we had more than 100 milli millimeters of uh, precipitation only in July. So I had to treat them once uh, with copper, the resistant varieties, uh, but in most years we don't treat them at all. So right now, um, every day I'm in the vineyards and we're cutting down our Pinot Blanc and Gewürztraminer because we're also taking out those vineyards in order to plant more uh, Johannita, Solaris and Souvenir Gris, which are all uh, white varieties. So overall, uh, I can say as the junior winemaker here now that our future or the future of Northern Italy or especially our region here are the resistant varieties um, just due to the amazing um, qualities when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to fighting the mildew pressure. So I'll pass uh, over now to my brother Julian and I'll be back for questions and answers later. Yeah, good evening everyone. Uh, my part in the company is uh, direction of sales and uh, marketing. And as Max mentioned now many times, over 90% of the wines we sell are made from resistant varieties. And I have to say it was completely different 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. It changes nearly every year now uh, in a positive, optimistic way. Like 20 years ago, it was very difficult to sell uh, wines made from resistant varieties. And it gets, it's always getting better every uh, year now, especially since 2015. There has been a huge interest uh, not only by farmers like us who plant the vines, but also from customers, hoteliers, uh, restauranteurs, 
and uh, Vinotech owners in the resistant varieties. And since 2019, I am speaking about a real boom uh, of the sales of the PV wines. And for example, also our uh, all our PV wines are the wines in our company which uh, win the most um, awards and achieve also the highest price uh, when it comes to sales. And for example, also today I was uh, in the morning and the afternoon here in the Dolomites. That's our skiing uh, paradise we have here in Italy. So there are many uh, clients for us we sell to. And I was at some restaurants and hotels and also they were very interested in the resistant varieties because many of them uh, keep telling me, yeah, now on the wine menu, I'm also um, going to make a space for organic and uh, resistant, uh, organic wines and resistant uh, varieties, PV wines. So uh, we need some good PV wines. And uh, this never was the case 15 or 20 years ago. Now it's completely different. And also many, many uh, producers here are calling and uh, writing emails and asking how to work better with these resistant varieties. And um, I'm just going to give you an example. Last uh, week, uh, one of the most famous wine producers in the world, the uh, Marchese di Frescobaldi, and the um, ex enologist of the Massetto uh, vineyard came to visit us to learn more about PV wines, because also they now in Tuscany are very interested in um, planting resistant varieties in order to reduce uh, the spraying and so to reduce costs and uh, time, which in the end time is always money and also to protect uh, nature as well. And um, so we here in Europe, in Italy, especially in the north of Italy, uh, we are looking, we believe at a very bright future regarding resistant varieties. Now the white varieties we uh, have been using for the last 20 years uh, from Freiburg, from Germany, as Max said. And um, for example, Merlot Corus is an Italian red variety, which is really young. We planted it in 2015. And um, Divico, another red variety, we have been now using for a few years and also very uh, satisfied with the quality. And uh, we cannot wait to, um, let's, I wouldn't call it experiment, but to grow, to, um, choose some also some new varieties and to plant them and see what the future then uh, brings to us. Thank you. Um, I have a question about how you select those grapes. Uh, from my understanding, the grapes you mentioned, for example, Divico is monogenic resistant, where there's others that you planted that are polygenic resistant. So they're, they were breeded to resist to many diseases where there's others that you've planted that are just were created to resist to speci one specific thing. Um, how do you decide what to plant? Because it's such a, it's so young, you don't have a lot of experience in terms of how they will taste. So what guides you to, to plant those grapes? Um, I think I'll answer this question as the winemaker. So where we live, it's a very hilly terrain and also with a lot of mountains. Uh, so you have a lot of microclimates within our area. So uh, that alone gives you a lot of different factors, what variety to plant. For example, the Divico, we don't plant it here on 500 meters above sea level at the winery, but down in the valley at the lake on 200 meters, where it's uh, much warmer and there's, where there's much more wind. So the wind is a big factor from June until September. We have every day starting at 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, four hours of really strong wind from the south that starts at the city of Verona and comes all the way up to us to the Austrian border. So that again gives you, assists you again in um, working against the mildew pressure. But uh, the, one of the other varieties we have, the Solaris, uh, German variety from Freiburg is also resistant to cold temperatures. So it's very premature. So I cannot plant it here on 500 meters above sea level. Our Solaris is uh, one of the highest vineyards in Europe and it grows on 1,250 meters above sea level. 
because here the temperature it's it's too warm it would mature in the middle of august so we plant it in the mountains where it's uh, cooler um, which is the perfect climate for it so we harvest at the end of september mid-october but there is more rain there but due to the cooler temperatures the mildew pressure is not even half as high as down here in the valley so there's always many different factors you have to take into account and now with the last few years with um, a climate change we don't have more or less precipitation in one year but it comes in different waves we can have an extremely cold and wet may then very hot and dry june then again a lot of rain in july then a dry august it it it, it moves around which it didn't it didn't do like 15 or 20 years ago so that those are the new challenges for example um this year in july like um uh, Mr. Mahler said before, uh, like when he left his vineyard for a few days, it also happened here this summer in July. We, um, I didn't go into my vineyard for three or four days. I was in Germany uh, visiting clients. I came back and I already saw that the mildew pressure was a bit too high in those days because it just kept raining and raining and raining and raining. While in June it was 35 degrees Celsius and it didn't rain one drop in 30 days. So you have to be really careful with what's happening from week to week in our business. That's also very important when choosing the varieties, planting varieties, uh, treating the varieties. And do you have a concern that, because you're, 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 you're pretty much betting on, on those grapes for the future, uh, do you have a concern sometimes that the disease will just find a way to adapt in the long, in the long run? Um, yeah, um, we have to say that, um, some of the varieties we planted more than 20 years ago. Now, after 20 years, um, the resistance isn't as high anymore as it used to be. But if you um, work well in the vineyard, if everything's clean and tidy, if, um, if you always check on your vines every two or three days, then that loss of resistance, it's not that much. You, it's okay, it's there, but I mean, 20 years is a lot of time. It's not two years or three years, it's 20 years in the end. So another red variety, we have a French one, a really old French variety, it's called uh, Chambossin, uh, which was planted uh, by our father in 2001. And this summer I treated it with copper for the first time since 2014. It was a very wet summer. So yeah, okay, maybe it lost a bit of resistance, but only in July, we had 150 millimeters of uh, rainfall. So I'm not too worried about that. Um, actually, on the contrary, I'm very optimistic with these varieties because in Canada, uh, as we heard before, maybe you have to do a few treatments per year. But here, what our experience is, our personal experience, I'm not talking about statistics from research centers, just our experience from us or many other farmers here who uh, chose to plant these vines is that instead of treating the vines with copper and sulfur 15, 18 or 20 times per year, we treat zero or maximum one or two treatments per year. And that for the last 20 years continuously. So that alone gives me a lot of hope for the future. There's a question coming in here and I know this answer, but I'm gonna let someone from the panel, uh, maybe Gaetan, if you couldn't put someone, everyone on the, um, I'm going to start this, this panel discussion. Um, so someone is asking, uh, could these new hybrids uh, be used in other parts of the world where heat spikes and water shortage are an issue, or are they mainly uh, the answer to struggling uh, with mildew? And we can, we can use that question for uh, newly developed hybrids and, and also hybrids. Whoever uh, wants to go, it's an open question. <laughs> We're having a little technical issue here. Oh, hello? Yes. You can hear? Oh, okay. I, just, I know from our experience with the hybrids that we grow, um, uh, yes, they're adaptable for sure. Like um, they're, they're less prone to, uh, I think, they can handle dry weather or heat spikes without uh, as much vine health being necessarily sacrificed. But in terms of um, the crop quality of the other grape, 
they, they, they still do need adequate moisture and, um, and depending on the variety, like a, a moderated temperature uh, cycle through the growing season uh, and heat spikes at the wrong time, uh, you know, potentially like post variation can still present problems for these, for these um, varieties. In terms of the quality of the, of the wine, the fruit you're going to grow. In terms of vine health, though, they are, they're, they're more resilient to those extremes. So I guess it's sort of two, depending on which, um, how you come at it. Um, they're, they're not like a cure-all for, for those, those scenarios in terms, of, especially when it comes to wine quality. Yes, the other <laughs> Yes, so I was going to say, you know, I think all of us are, that are speaking today are talking about, we work with hybrids that are specifically for more northern climates, which are typically more humid and more wet. Whereas I know here in the United States, there are several other regions that are working with different kinds of hybrids that are specifically adapted for those areas. So for example, in Texas, excuse me, they work with a hybrid called Blanc de Bois, which is specific for their concerns, which are, it's very dry there. And they're, it's a variety that can withstand uh, the drier climate. Uh, there's a lot of activity right now happening in California looking at uh, hybrids that will work there and a lot of research being done both on the farm level and at UC Davis and farmers in UC Davis have finally gotten together to start talking about uh, both indigenous wild varieties and new newer hybrid varieties that will work for what's happening in California. So while our particular varieties that we've talked about today might not work in those circumstances uh, or as well. There are lots of other varieties that that could or do. <laughs> and my understanding also is in those research center, uh, the, in the new wave of newly created hybrids, some of them uh, are created to resist to drought and heat. So it's something I think that's ongoing in the, in the research. Um, if we look at the hybrids today, so we've been making, man has been making hybrid, trying to find solutions since the, the 19th century. Uh, but we look today at the plantation of hybrids, they still represent in the world 4.4% of what's planted. Uh, you know, one of, one of the things that's been holding people are often the taste associated to hybrids of planting more. Uh, now we're seeing kind of a renaissance of the hybrids. The uh, cu customer seems to be um, curious. The consumer are curious. They're more open to different taste. Um, so is I'm going to ask everyone, and maybe you can all answer to this, but um, are hybrids here to stay? Well, do you think that percentage will increase uh, in plantation? Are we going to... Are we going to see a growth in, in plantation of hybrids, or this is just a passing trend? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, if I look at my region or uh, the northern Italian regions, we can see a very, very sharp increase in the plantings of uh, resistant varieties in the last years. And for example, the amount that was plastered uh, plus, uh, what that was planted in the last two or three years was not planted in the previous 30 years. So it's now going really fast. It maybe sounds now like a lot, but I just read the statistic the other day. So in Alto Adige, in our region, the resistant varieties now make up for 1% of all the uh, vineyards that we have. It's, uh, it doesn't sound like a lot, but believe me that 1% um, 10 years ago was unthinkable. 1% 10 years ago was like, oh my God, that's never going to happen. And now I think in the last 24 months that 1% happened and it's going pretty fast. So I'm sure that in the next 10, 15 years, maybe in 2035, we'll have at least 10 to 20% of all vineyards um, will be resistant varieties, at least in our area and Northern Italy for sure, because they're huge companies 
especially in the Prosecco area, all the areas where there's a lot of mass production. And those people, they're smart, they want to save money. So if they don't want to spray 15 to 20 times per year in every hectare they own, they will choose the resistant varieties, which they're already doing. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to say yes, but uh, there we will see more planting. However, uh, listening to everyone today and taking into consideration Mike's perspective in Quebec, I think what is gonna be really important is finding the right hybrids, just like you would for vinifera, finding the right varieties for the right place. I mean, Mike talked about, you know, issues that they're having with the Minnesota varieties, which we use in Vermont. We are not having those kinds of issues. I mean, we have vineyards here that are 20 to 25 years old that are, they're not erratic in their production. You know, they're very, very consistent in their production. We're not seeing issues of split uh, trunks or crown gall. Uh, that are, uh, you know, those things might be caused by poor farming, but if somebody's working well in the vineyard, uh, there's been a lot of success for healthy vineyards here and making healthy wines. And maybe, you know, it seems funny that, you know, Vermont is here and Quebec is right next to it. You would think the same varieties would work for, for both of us, but there are obviously things that are different enough in our climates and our topography and geology that you know those hybrids might not be the right ones for Quebec. Um, the gentlemen in the Alto Adige, they're having a fantastic time with the ones, the, the vines that they're planting there, but those may not be the same varieties that would work in some place like Puglia or Burgundy um, or California. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I think it's going to be key to figure out what works where. We can't make a blanket uh, decision that any hybrid is going to work in any environment. We have to use the same care and thought uh, and experimentation in, in each region that wants to pursue this. Yes, yeah, Matthew? I, if I could just add to that, because I agree 100% with what was just said there um because yeah it, it's definitely it's i know in our case it's not that we're growing it, it's not mutually exclusive it's not a zero-sum game i don't think in our industry that hybrids succeed but if it doesn't either it's, it, they there's a there's a place for for all of them all of the above in our region um i uh, just they have their own unique uh um spot each of the, the hybrids have their own unique spot within that and uh and it isn't, and it isn't just all hybrids. And like in our case, we've been growing hybrid and vinifera for coming up on 40 years now. And we continue to, to grow both and plant both. Um, um, but uh, the hybrid, we're, we're specifically growing, planting back on or that specifically that hybrid for us and our site and in our mix of wines, our portfolio, and, and relative to the markets we sell into, it's back on a wire for us. That's really where we're seeing this amazing success. It's not across the number of the other hybrids that are grown here for us, for Henry Appellum. Um, so it is, so it's, it's not generally specific to an area. It could be specific to the, uh, a winery and your own situation, your own portfolio of wines and, and the type of wines you make and the market that you're selling into, various markets you choose to be a part of. Um, but I, overall, though, do I see more being planted? Yes. I mean, we're in, in our area. Uh, there's there's a handful of hybrids that are where there's is success happening amongst a number of producers, and more going in the ground. Yes, the consistency of production, um, the, uh, the less spray inputs that are required. These are all are bonuses that uh, that are seeing more and more going to the ground. Interesting, because Mike, Mike, I think it's quite the opposite in Quebec. I feel, and I don't have stats in front of me, but I feel like we're starting to move more from hybrids to vitis vinifera, no? We're, I think more and more producers seem to, the hybrids are here, but it seems like uh, there's more people like you who are actually going for the vitis vinifera. 
I think it's divided. It's going in both ways. Uh, I heard the statistics. I don't have them uh, right now, but I heard that uh, no, on the the hybrid side is still growing at, at a huge speed. A lots of lot is being planted as much as there's a lot of vinifera planted, and some people are, you know, changing over. But uh, no, I think it's really sort of going in two opposite directions. It'd be really interesting to see. You know, down the road, where where we are going to go meet back is, as Nachi said, you know, it's a mix of everything. It's not just one or the other. It's going to be, of course, uh, a mix of everything, finding the right spots. And, um, and yeah. I also so, think no. viticultural practices, right? We, we talk a lot about grapes, but there's so many mm -hmm. other things uh, to support the choice. Uh, you know, when I look at, at what you do, uh, what Deirdre do, right, with the biodynamic and all the preparation, I think... It's, you know, it's related to the spot that you are in your microclimate, uh, but also all the vineyard practices that are embraced uh, behind that, that also forms the decision of what uh, you can and cannot plant, I think. Um, so it's a... It's I truly a, believe that you can have, sorry to interrupt you, but it was just, uh, I was going to talk about it a bit, but the, the act of uh, sort of unlearning what we've learned and how we grow our vineyards and you know having these clear rows and mowed down the middle i mean everybody says oh that's going to stop the mildew but you know when you start thinking about it and you learn about the cycles and everything it's the, almost the complete opposite that you actually need growth under your vines and to stop the mildew from splashing up at least to stop the primary infections where we can actually save so much spray um so you're so right that the the idea of good farming practices and that we kind of think about that and vineyards don't always have to look like, you know, what we see in books, because that's not always the healthiest way to, to grow grapes. So there's a lot to learn on that end too. And uh, that we move to, we need to be thinking just as much on that side, because you could plant a hybrid, as Deirdre said about the crown gall. I mean, maybe it's bad farming practices. They're giving that, you know, hybrid a bad name in, in a certain spot. So uh, we definitely need to work on both at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think, I think it's a great way uh, to finish uh, the seminar. I think that going forward, uh, I think the consumers need to be open-minded. The producer need to also search for solutions, whether it's vineyard practices, sometimes reach out for, for hybrid because perhaps it's more, uh, it's more um, appropriate for where they are located. But I think keeping an op open-minded and also open discussion, right? And learning from the others, I think it's the way to go forward so that we can all reduce uh, what's used, pesticide and herbicides uh, and fungicides uh, so that, you know, with the challenges of climate change, we can have a greener future and more possible future also for producers. Um, I want to thank you all today for your time. It's been a very interesting discussion and I love having different point of view because I think this is how we grow. This is how we learn. Uh, there's not one solution. I think there's multiple, multiple solution and it's by talking to each other that we actually move forward. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who listened today. Just as a reminder, all of the uh, seminars of Tasting Climate Change are available to you until December 30th. So if you've missed some of them, uh, you you can use the link provided from Evenbright and you can listen to the seminars whenever you can until December 30th. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week.